National Public Radio presents a conversation with President Salvador Allende of Chile. I'm Rich Adams in Washington, and with me is the diplomatic correspondent for the Hearst newspapers, John Wallach, who has just returned from a trip to Santiago, Chile, where he interviewed President Allende. Allende is the first Marxist leader of any nation in the Western Hemisphere to have been chosen in free and open elections. In fact, democracy in Chile has a long tradition, one that many Chileans today feel is endangered by Allende's avowed aim of turning Chile into a traditional socialist state. Because there is freedom of speech and freedom of the press, Chileans have not been afraid to express themselves, but not always in support of Allende and not always peacefully. Beginning with the march two years ago of 50,000 middle-class housewives banging empty pots and pans over their heads, there have been so many protest demonstrations and riots that the casual visitor to Santiago might conclude a civil war was about to break out. The tension is due partly to the fact that Allende himself was elected as a minority president, with only 36% of the vote in a three-man race. He heads a coalition known as the Popular Unity, made up of socialists, communists, and extreme left-wing splinter groups. The opposition Christian Democrat and right-wing national parties control the legislature. They had hoped before last March's congressional elections to win two-thirds of both houses of Congress so they could impeach Allende. They failed. The March elections, which were the first real test of Allende's popularity, resulted in a net gain of seven seats for the government coalition. But they also proved Allende had been successful in at least one aspect of turning Chile into a socialist state, that of developing a political consciousness among the workers that was as good as gold at the ballot box. In those March elections, the popular unity increased its margin from the 36 percent Allende received in 1970 to 43.7 percent. Some observers believe this has brought Chile even closer to civil war because the opposition has become desperate. A two-month-old strike at Chile's largest copper plant, El Teniende, has already forced cancellation of copper exports, Chile's most reliable source of foreign exchange. The disruption of the social fabric, whether intentional or not, has set peasant against worker, worker against his employer, and class against class. Allende has been charged with attempting the constitutional extinction of the middle class. They believe their freedom is being subverted by Allende's campaign to destroy their economic base. Chile has the highest rate of inflation in the world, 200 percent, and the resulting black market and almost total disappearance of consumer goods has set the economy into a tailspin. John, against this background, to what extent is the United States responsible for Chile's troubles? Well, the United States certainly hasn't helped. Uh, after uh, Allende expropriated the three major American copper companies, the United States took uh, several steps, expropriated them without, of course, paying any compensation. The United States cut off all economic aid, it stopped export-import bank loans, and it made it virtually impossible for Chile to get financing to buy such things as Boeing jets, for example, to replace the aging fleet of Boeings already in operation. Chile's defaulting on its debt obligations to many nations in the world made it impossible for Allende to get credit from international lending institutions such as the World Bank. Then when you throw into this already steaming cauldron the discovery that ITT, had tried to bribe the CIA into blocking Allende's election, political dynamite in Chile, particularly for Allende, it's not hard to see how relations between the United States and Chile went steadily downhill for the past three years. Now, in a sense, we've reached a turning point. Uh, President Nixon has said uh, repeatedly for the last year that the United States wants to have the kind of relationship with Chile that Chile wants to have with us. Allende has, in a sense, turned that on its ear, asking point blank, what kind of relationship does the United States want? Uh, copper is the, is the sore point, and uh, it's, uh, in a sense, it's the, uh, it's the wrong point for the United States to have strained its relationships with Chile because the Chilean population is almost uh, entirely united on this one, this one point. Regardless of whether they support Allende or are opposed to Allende, they support his moves to expropriate copper, which is Chile's uh, major export earner and uh, uh, most important natural resource. Uh, Allende, of course, uh, contends that the copper companies took so much uh, in profits out of Chile over the past uh, 10 or 15 years that he doesn't owe them any compensation and that he had an absolute right to seize and expropriate their assets. Uh, as I said, we may have reached a turning point. Uh, the uh, turning point may have been brought about uh, by the 
a fact that in the March elections, Allende's coalition won 43% of the votes. This has, in a sense, forced the United States to take a new hard look at socialism in Chile, perhaps for the first time accepting socialism in Chile as a permanent thing. For the past three years, it's been my impression that uh, the State Department, the White House, had hoped that uh, one thing or another might lead to Allende's overthrow. Uh, the American government denies it, but we've been giving, for example, $12 million in military aid consistently over the last three years to the Chilean Armed Forces. The uh, White House denies that this is uh, uh, in order to keep our uh, links with the armed forces in hopes that they might overthrow the Allende government, but in fact that, that seems a possibility. Now, since the March elections in which uh, the coalition won 43 percent, it appears that the administration is taking a new look at Chile. Secretary Rogers uh, met in Buenos Aires with Salvador Allende for the first time, uh, Rogers becoming the highest Nixon administration official to have met Allende. I asked uh, President Allende when I was in Santiago what was necessary to restore an atmosphere of trust to U.S.-Chilean relations. First of all, I believe it is necessary to eliminate all artificial factors that make normal relations more difficult. Chile. Chile, of course, has points of view that are different from those of the United States government. But nobody can say that our relationship has deteriorated to the point where it is impossible to have a dialogue or to the point where the dialogue has to be interrupted. <coughs> On the other hand, I think that the United States should listen more, not only to what Chile has to say, but to what other Latin American countries have to say, and to what other non-aligned nations have said and continue to say. For example, the foreign ministers of Latin America, through their organization known as SECLA, more than two and a half years ago, let Mr. Nixon know those American policies with which we disagree. And do you know there has still been no response from Mr. Nixon to these points. In the case of the Latin American countries themselves, the defeat of the Alliance for Progress should also teach the United States something. That was an experience for the United States that it should not forget. Even at the highest level, and I mean the White House, you have to listen to what was said at the UNDP conference and at the third UNCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. This is probably the most important result of Secretary Rogers' trip to Latin America. The effect on him I'm sure is much greater than the effect on any of the countries that he visited. I think he's a man of real sensitivity, a statesman with a great deal of experience because he has been able to recognize facts. The important thing to remember is that there must be an awareness that there is a very intimate link between the interests of multinational corporations and the policies which the Department of State follows. Because of this, we run the risk of creating 
anti-American reactions in Chile. And this, of course, is not good. Such charges, of course, are not in entirely justified. Because even within the United States, there are millions of people who share our point of view, who recognize our right to live, who are not about to defend either with, with arms or political power the interests of the huge multinational corporations. The uh, anti-American feeling in Chile by uh, linking uh, the ITT uh, interference in Chilean politics with the CIA and the American government. You seem to have made this uh, link rather directly. Uh, do you believe, in fact, there is or was a CIA, ITT, uh, fray, uh, conspiracy? In the first place, I want to separate out. I don't want to discuss any of the charges against ex-president Eduardo Frey. For this reason, in my speech to the International Labor Conference, I did not make reference to the Washington Post. I want this to be very clear. I never, no matter how respectable a newspaper or a journalist may be, I could never echo his words without having proof, without this journalist providing the absolute proof of his allegations. I wouldn't like it if other politicians in, in this country or some other country believed what some journalists say about me. <laughs> what you set forth is quite accurate. For the first time at the labor conference, I referred to the relationship between ITT and the CIA and some men in the State Department. But I referred to them by using the declarations of the witnesses before the Senate subcommittee. I haven't woven a network or conspiracy. I haven't charged anyone with anything that has not happened. I have only said Mr. So-and-so said this, Mr. So-and-so said something else. You come to your own conclusions. I haven't wanted to reach any conclusions. I have limited myself to the testimony of people who have sworn under oath. In the United States, I understand, there are very serious sanctions against perjury. Therefore, it will be up to the Senate subcommittee to reach its own conclusions. But I believe that very rarely have there been facts that have more fully shaken domestic opinion in the United States whether it is Watergate or the ITT investigations. Why should I add any more adjectives to this when for months millions of words have been written? When television airwaves are transmitting live sessions in and when there already the is a complete uh, awareness Watergate. of what is going on. Uh, you have said that uh, Watergate uh, proves the, uh, that uh, multinational corporations uh, are international culprits and that this proves the beginning of uh, uh, the end of the capitalist uh, system. In the first place, I never said that they were culprits. I never used that word. I never used words like that. 
el comienzo del fin del sistema the capitalista place, Watergate. I don't think it is the beginning of the end of the capitalist system. Yo creo que es un escándalo I think Watergate is a huge scandal which has que ha tenido gran repercusión wide repercussions y sobre el cual nosotros tenemos una información about which we have gathered information emanada de las investigaciones to Chile, hechas en, en Estados Unidos which has come from the investigations carried out in the United States. Ahora, algo muy serio de haber ocurrido. Now, obviously, something very serious happened. Tanta gente ha renunciado. When so many people have been forced to resign. Cuando tanta reacción se ha producido. When there has been so much reaction. Cuando ha sido tan fuerte la reacción. When que todavía, todavía the se reaction has been so strong that the political foundations of the government are still being rocked. Pero yo no he usado ningún calificativo. But I haven't used any unfair adjectives. E esa es la impresión que se forma cualquier persona que lee. ¿no? And that is the impression of any fair-minded observer. It's quite possible, I think, that um, because of the effect that Watergate has had on American leaders, uh, they will listen more deeply and more seriously to some of the movements that are existing in the rest of the world, such as the one here in Chile, of which they have been ignorant. I hope that this will be the case. It would be most logical. There was a break-in at the Chilean embassy the same month that the group broke into the Watergate. Three of the Cuban exiles uh, were in Washington at the same time uh, of the Chilean break-in. The Chilean embassy in Washington has been unsuccessful in its requests to get fingerprints of the people who broke into the embassy so that a comparison could be made with the fingerprints of the group that broke into the Watergate. Do you have any information yourself that would indicate that uh, these may have been the same people? Sí. Yes, this has been said, and it also appears that some people have categorically affirmed this. But we have not wanted to make any kind of public declaration and much less exploit this politically. It's far too serious. Sería tener que afirmar It would mean que se han barrenado todos los conceptos y las normas internacionales. It, that all concepts of international behavior en cuanto al, al respeto as far as que se tiene que tener respect for embassies and foreign emissaries had been swept aside. Con las representaciones de los países es un hecho de una proyección it would be an event of such huge international magnitude because of what it implies that to make a statement or ring the bells of denunciation without having proof would not be right. It's far too serious. But you have suspicions that it would, may have been the same people. Judging from what has been seen, it is possible. The United States says it has been searching for ways to end the three-year impasse in relations with Chile. One of the possible avenues for reconciliation is a 1914 treaty that provides for a special three-man commission to adjudicate bilateral problems. But the treaty specifically exempts questions of national sovereignty, giving Chile a way out if it doesn't want the copper dispute to be settled by outsiders. The copper companies themselves have indicated they would accept international arbitration, but Chile, despite its avowed respect for international law, has never been willing to submit the dispute to arbitration. Even the special copper court set up by Allende himself and composed of three independent judges has been unwilling to tackle this explosive question. Most observers believe the court is simply afraid of the political repercussions of a decision that would be favorable to the American companies. 
I asked Allende about Chile's history of refusing to be bound by international arbitration. Chile Chile has a very long history of respect for treaties. When there have been opposing, opposing points of view, then we have looked to treaties and to international arbitration to find a road to solution. This is what happened with Argentina. We submitted our dispute with the British Crown over Beagle Channel to arbitration. So what you say isn't really fair. On the contrary, we are very much in favor of respect for treaties and international commitments. If there is a commitment, an agreement between Chile and the United States, dating back to 1914, when it could not be foreseen that we would have problems, we will ask for this instrument to be used. I wasn't talking about that. I cannot guarantee that the tribunal will take the case. That would be prejudging and puts me in an unfair position in view of the disagreement over the competence of the tribunal. Submit these disputes to the judgment of an international tribunal and to be bound by the decision of this tribunal because the treaty excludes this such international uh, commitments in questions of sovereignty. <laughs> Uh, would Chile be willing, uh, if Chile this is acceptable as a framework, es to accept the decision of such an international court on the questions that are separating? The first thing that we have to find out is whether we resort to this special, special tribunal. We must take into consideration that it isn't a tribunal that can resolve anything. It doesn't have the power to enforce its decisions, but it can suggest, it can indicate the road towards solution. If one resorts to a tribunal and then consults it periodically, undoubtedly, one has a moral obligation. Isn't that so? It's true. Absolutely. That moral commitment is a very important step. We have no reason now to anticipate what the tribunal eventually will decide. We are willing to, to submit our case and the tribunal will judge whether it is within its competence to make a decision. But when we, when we talked the last time about copper, one year ago, you talked, about the, you talked about the possibility of a special tribunal in Chile uh, being able to resolve uh, this question, uh, a special court in the copper tribunal in Chile. And this court, apparently, for political reasons, has been afraid to uh, take this case. 
But why? Why for political reasons? I don't understand otherwise why so much time has passed since we talked the previous time without the case of the council. No, he's mistaken. And a journalist of his ability and ethics cannot make these remarks. El tribunal no ha resuelto políticamente. The tribunal has not failed to resolve anything conforme a derecho. Because of political intimidation, the tribunal has acted in accordance with Chilean law. It rendered a verdict that was partly favorable to Cerro and against some arguments made by the government. That is why we are going to pay compensation. Therefore, your charge isn't really fair. And I would ask you not to repeat it in or out of Chile because it isn't true. Uh, you acknowledged it was difficult, uh, perhaps more difficult than you expected, to convert the entrenched middle classes uh, to socialism. You said that some people were becoming desperate. How do you feel now about the last three years and about the future? In the first place, I want to insist that Chile is not a socialist country. This is a capitalist country. And my government is not a socialist government. Neither, as the press likes to say, is it a Marxist government. I am a Marxist. That's something else. 